This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 885, recorded on April 5th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there. How you doing? Uh, I'm just getting the weather up here because we've been we've had a long conversation that probably should have been recorded. Um, and, it was. Uh, it was. <laughs> oh wow! Well, that ought to go into posterity somewhere. Um, it is. Get this: ninety-two degrees. <laughs> It's crazy. Um, and sunny. Yeah, it is. It's, it, it actually is crazy because tomorrow it's going to be like 75. Because we are at okay. 11C, so I'm still wearing like a, a down jacket and a scarf. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. It's great to be here and see you guys. Uh, it is 56 Fahrenheit, 13C here. So uh, slightly colder than with Rich, uh, but sunny. I think it was sunny when I got here. Yeah. I do have to put a webcam in the other window so I can look out because, you know, it's it's what I used to always do at Columbia, look out the window, but can't do it anymore. But um, it gets kind of warmish during the day. Warmish, what is it, 50s in your (laughs) Fahrenheit, right? 50s? And then it goes down cool at night. All right, we have a couple of papers for your learning today, and one is a preprint in BioArchive called An ACE2-Dependent Sarbecovirus in Russian Bats is Resistant to SARS-CoV-2 Vaccines. Uh, This goes with our interest in bats and what viruses they have and where they're located. So this comes from... Uh, Tulane University and Washington State University. You know, they always say, you don't have to say Washington State because Washington is different from Washington, D.C., but they have Washington State in their name. How about that? Well, I guess New Jer- I guess state universities have that anyway. Yeah, that, right? that, I think it differentiates them from UW. Yeah, Washington University. Anyway, uh, Stephanie Seifert is the first author. And uh, Michael Letko is the last author. And this caught my eye because it is about coronavirus and bats and not from Southeast Asia, right? So this is all about uh, asking whether any sarbecoviruses, uh, beta coronaviruses, um, can infect human cells. And this one from uh, Russian isolates. So just to remind you, the spike protein of coronaviruses is the protein that binds to the cell receptor. For SARS-CoV-2, of course, the receptor is ACE2. And there's a very specific part of spike called the receptor binding domain, or RBD, which they nicely say contains all of the information necessary to engage with the host receptor. And that's true. On its own, it will bind... um, ACE2. And that's like, uh, I'm trying to uh, get the figure up here. That's like just a couple of a hundred amino acids. Yeah, out it's, of the it's, whole thing. Uh, is, it, is it even that much? Uh, they have, yeah, 323 through 501. I assume yep. that's amino acids. Amino acids, yeah. yeah. Yep. So that's uh, not even 200, 174. Something like that. So it's even a, it's sort of the central portion of the linear part of the S1 domain. That's the uh, N-terminal domain. Uh, so it's it's uh, only, it looks like maybe just over a third, if that, according to the cartoon, of that whole amino acid sequence. So it's only a portion of it. So uh, the... RBDs of Sarbeco viruses have been put into clades, you know, based on their sequence and some information about their function. Clade 1 from Asian bats binds to ACE2. The members of that bind to ACE2. Clade 2, also in Asian bats, does not bind to ACE2. It has some 
deletions of the sequence. And clade three RBDs are in Africa and Europe. They some of them appeared to bind ACE two, and others appear to bind something else. So, so uh, clade three is a bit different. And then, apparently, more recently, uh, some viruses have been identified in China that uh, whose RBDs uh, are, are clade four. They also bind uh, ACE two. Yeah, and and this particular paragraph um, made me think a lot about biodiversity in general um, and wonder things like, um, is this specific to specific species of bats? Um, And here we hear a little bit about Asian bats, African bats, and European bats. Um, How broadly in Asia, Africa, and Europe have we looked at these bats? Um, and what about, say, North American and South American bats? Are the bats too different to have viruses like these, or have we not yet looked for said viruses? Um, and so it made me want to think a whole lot about what can we do in terms of just looking for similar viruses elsewhere? Um, how much more diversity is there? It certainly seems that everywhere you look, there are coronaviruses. Exactly. I think we haven't looked Anywhere near enough to know, right? right? That's what yeah. I think too. <laughs> I mean, even in Asia, where most of the looking has happened, we still don't know a lot mm-hmm. because every time people look, they find something slightly different, right? Mm-hmm. So, right, and, and you know, this paper reminded me, like, oh, right, there are some in Europe too. Yeah, um, which I yeah. never really think about, and and so, how much have we looked in no, Europe? We, we very we do hardly any wildlife sampling and looking for viruses. It's really a big gap in our understanding, unfortunately, which will bite us eventually, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it has already bitten us, I think, yeah. and yeah. may it do it again. again. Yes, we're, just, we're just getting through the big bite. Yeah. Boy, have we. I was thinking, though, you know, in Russia and Africa, Europe, are there risk factors like live, like markets? Or someone told me not to call them live markets, just call them markets, right? There must be. So... I, don't know I, I have I have been in such a market in Africa, so yes. Oh, right in South Africa, you've been, you've seen such markets, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All in right, fact, so, I really wanted to photograph them, and I wasn't allowed. Oh, uh, they stopped you. Um, so uh, a lot of the things that were being sold in the market were used for. Um, indigenous medicine purposes. Yeah. And um, many of the people who would were purveying things thought that if you took a picture, it would actually take away the healing properties. Um, so no photography was allowed. Oh, well, that's interesting. Huh. Okay. All right. So uh, in 2020, two clade three sarbeckos were found in bats in Russia. Rhinolophus bats, uh, same genus that we talk about in Southeast Asia. And these viruses were called Costa 1 and 2, K-H-O-S-T-A-1, Rhinolophus ferumequinum, <laughs> and Costa 2, and Rhinolophus hipposideros. Uh, and these these are, again, clade 3, so their RBDs are quite divergent from uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 RBDs. And other people did that, and other people have worked on these viruses. Apparently, the Costa 2 RBD can bind ACE2, human ACE2. And so uh, they ask in this question, they try to extend these studies in this question. They look at binding and also uh, infection. So uh, this, uh, this, by the way, I don't know if this is correct, but isn't Sochi National Park where the Olympics were? Is that correct? I, or? I think Sochi is where the Olympics were. Um, Not in the National Park. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if they were in the National Park, but Sochi is where the Olympics were. So these were. bat samples were identified in 2020 near Sochi National Park. Okay, so the only reason I know that is because of the Olympic. Um, they are an, an analysis of the uh, the gene ORF1AB that encodes the RNA polymerase and accessory proteins. Uh, showed that they were closely related to another Sarbeco virus found in Bulgaria in 2008. So th- I didn't know that that was found. So uh, these and these viruses uh, form a lineage of Sarbecos that are distinct uh, from the SARS-CoV-1, et cetera, lineage. Um, these are also similar 
to Sarbeco viruses of clade 3 found in Uganda and Rwanda. So they're all over. <laughs> so what did they do, the experiments? First of all, they took uh, the spike of SARS-CoV-1 and replaced its RBD with the COSTA RBDs. All right, just the spike protein, and then they could make the protein. They have now a plasmid with a chimeric spike, encoding a chimeric spike, and they can uh, produce the protein. And they also have such plasmids for, you know, their Bulgarian and Ugandan and Rwandan uh, virus RBDs. They also did SARS-CoV-2 RBD, RATG13 RBD, and they use this to make pseudotype viruses with vesicular stomatitis virus. And the, vi the VSV encodes a, a green fluorescent protein, luciferase, so they can use that to measure uh, virus reproduction. So for those of you who are about to report these people to uh, the authorities, <laughs> uh, this is not making a new coronavirus that is going to spread all over the place by using laboratory techniques. This is making uh, a molecule, the spike protein, to do experiments with and sticking it in a completely different virus uh, where it's not going to, uh, you know, propagate or cause any harm just as a, as a method to study whether or not this, these chimeric proteins work. And by doing that, uh, try and understand what these different uh, receptor binding domains do. Someone asked me the other day, what do you think of the Rockefeller people making that polymutant SARS virus? Don't you think that was dangerous? I said, well, it wasn't SARS-CoV-2. It was VSV. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pseudotype. So you need to take, you have, you have to look at things and make sure you right. have your facts right before you go crazy. Right. <laughs> All right. So they take these pseudotyped VSVs uh, with Costa chimeric costa spikes and they infect uh, a human liver cell line HUH7 I don't know why they would do, use that cell line because well I, you know I, I puzzled over this because because they do two different cells they do the human liver cells and we will talk about what they get out of it and then they do uh, BHK cells and and in the end I think the human liver cells just give you some sort of an assessment as to Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, it is VSV, isn't it? So it doesn't really give you an assessment. No. I mean, it's just entry. Are, it's just entry. You're just but looking at as entry. We'll find That's out. It. It's not necessarily the entry you want to look at. Yeah. Right? No, it's it's just entry, really. Yeah. All right, HUH seven, um, and um, they didn't. These pseudotypes, this Costa pseudotype virus, did not enter these cells, and they know that because they're looking for. GFP luciferase signals, and they don't see that, even though this uh, the cell does have uh, ACE2, but it's low, apparently. That is, the uh, uh, reporter VSV has a, a, a gene in it that makes a fluorescent protein. So if it gets in the cells, you can, uh, you can see that fluorescence, and that a, a, allows you to score the entry. Yeah, so Easily. you know that the virus has gotten into the cell, um, uncoded its genome, and has tried to start making proteins yeah, from that and genome. and they do all that by flow cytometry, right? Count mm -hmm. the fluorescent cells. Mm -hmm. So no entry, but if they add trypsin to the infection, then they see an entry signal for SARS-CoV-1-2 RBDs and COSTA. So SARS-CoV-1-2, COSTA, RBD, pseudotypes, no entry without trypsin. And uh, it's known that trypsin will enhance uh, Sarbeco virus entry uh, based on ACE2. So, uh, so they think this is uh, improving ACE2 infection. And, and you may remember way at the beginning of this pandemic that Barrick Lab published a paper showing that trypsin enhances uh, coronavirus entry by cleaving the spike. And so if the trypsin isn't, if, if the protease isn't present, then that, that will help. So is this, um, I, I was, I was puzzled by this. So trypsin is a protease. Is that, does it have the same sort of, it does, does it have the same sort of specificity as purin, a uh, furin? I mean, are we? Uh, no, are it's we not, right? It's, it's uh, 
basic amino acid residues, right? It's right. not furin. So it's not necessarily cleaving at the normal cleavage site that no. is well, cleaved during this entry, right? Well, no, it, if it's cleaving basic amino acids, then it should cleave at that same general site because it's a polybasic cleavage site. It is a polybasic cleavage site, but I don't remember um, how, if it's exactly added or slightly somewhere else. Let's take a look, because this was a paper actually published early on from Vincent Munster's lab, Functional Assessment of Cell Entry and Receptor Usage for SARS-CoV-2. Um, do they have trypsin in the abstract? Yeah, we show that host protease processing during entry is a barrier, and bypassing this barrier with trypsin allows uh, these viruses to enter human cells through an unknown receptor. So it may be... Yes, yeah, so you might be right. Trypsin enhances cleavages. Yes, exactly right. It might be that it's cutting right near the uh, site because you can imagine if it cut far away from it, that might not give you a right. proper. Uh, but, uh, and uh, even fusion. Munster says this is an unknown receptor. Was ACE two was known at that time, right? Because I got the impression right. from this paper that they weren't entirely sure That's whether this in the human liver cells they were assessing ACE two usage. Or something else. In I think particular, they, they're talking about a human receptor. That's yes. right. Yeah, right. They, yeah, they just say a receptor present in human cells. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. and um, and it's uh, in that regard, it's relevant that of the two Costa viruses or Costa viruses, Costa one in that assay in human liver cells works better than Costa two. Okay. Yeah. Um, and though, yeah. The, the receptor binding domain. So, as we'll see, I think that even argues that maybe it's not ACE2 that they're using in this. But we'll get to that. All right. So, next they take uh, BHK baby, baby hamster kidney cells, which um, which do not produce ACE2. Right? They're, they're hamster cells. They don't produce human ACE2. And they make a statement, which I hope is corrected in publication, they say they're considered non-permissive unless a receptor is supplemented. That's not the right term. It would be non-susceptible without a receptor. Permissivity is inside what happens beyond entry. Got okay. to listen to Quiv and read uh, Principles of Virality, Which it's, right? it's right there. Oh, this is take great. I, <laughs> I, I, now I got a sentence to take and uh, play with for my final exam. Yeah, yeah. Tell you what's wrong with this yeah. sentence. Yeah. From a Preprint. Uh, so what they did was to insert genes encoding various uh, ortholo human orthologs of known coronavirus receptors, and then they infect the cells with their panel of pseudotype uh, viruses. So COSTA-1 pseudotype didn't infect cells with any of these viruses, with, with these receptors. They include ACE2 and uh, aminopeptidase N, uh, a dipeptidyl peptidase 4, so that's the MERS coronavirus receptor. Aminopeptidase N is uh, some of the common cold coronas. So COSTA-1 didn't infect any of these cells. COSTA-2 infected cells uh, with human ACE2. And as, so did, as did other viruses that are known to use ACE2. Correct, correct. Um, now, they say that... Um, the amount of cell entry they get with the COSTA-2 pseudotype is similar to RATG-13. And if I recall, that's pretty poorly binding ACE2, and it won't infect cells as a consequence. And no one has ever grown RATG-13 in the lab. It's not clear if ACE2 is, is the bona fide receptor because it really binds poorly. Um, so this is not very good. It may be getting in, but it's not very good. And, and as Rich pointed out, Previously, with the human liver cells, COSTA-1 was better. With yeah. the BHK cells, COSTA-2 is a bit better. And that yeah, argues so, to me that, again, that in the human cells, you're looking at a different receptor. Yeah. Something COSTA-1 is ACE2. probably not doing ACE2, right? Right. right. I think you could, you could say that based on those two sets of data. Uh, and then um, they have coronavirus 229E, which could in fact the BHK is producing aminopeptidase N. That's good. That's that's the receptor for that. And the spike of MERS coronavirus infected cells in producing dipeptidyl peptidase 4. 
And that's all good because those are the known receptors uh, for those viruses. Okay, so that's uh, so and far. Course, those are those are RBD chimeras. Remember, they're putting the RBDs into SARS-CoV-1 spike. It would be, I mean, you know, this is probably asking for too much, but uh, <laughs> as as other controls, I mean, we're assuming in doing this that uh, putting the RBD on another background doesn't mess it up. I mean, and you could argue, I suppose that the reason that cost of one isn't working in this situation is that mm -hmm. if you stick the cost of one RBD into a SARS-CoV-1 background, that it doesn't work the same. That seems unlikely given all the other data. But another control you could do, I'm really going off the edge here, another control you could do is to put the um, MERS RBD into the SARS background or the uh, human, the 229E RBD into the SARS background and make sure they maintain their specificities under those circumstances. Just as, as an assurance that if you go swapping these RBDs into the SARS-CoV-1 background willy-nilly, that they retain their receptor specificity. Well, right. then the, the, the experiment we're going to do now, they just use the full length spike, I think, which gets right. around your issue. Yes, true. Yeah. Yes. So they made the full length Costa spike genes <clears throat> and they use those to make pseudotypes and then asked, uh, how do they infect human cells? So the full length Costa spikes could infect HUH7 cells, the liver cells, human liver cells in the presence of trypsin. Costa 2 spike could infect 293 cells that produce ACE2 without trypsin. Okay. And the, and the, once again, uh, yeah. The so Costa 1 doesn't bind ACE2. Yes. Apparently. Costa 1 doesn't bind ACE2. And the Costa 1 does better than Costa 2 full length in liver cells. Once mm -hmm. again, uh, that basically mimicking the result we saw previously with the yeah. Yeah. chimeras. Okay. Cool. And full in Costa 2 is less infectious than the SARS CoV based spike. I don't know which one they mean. Figure 2B, which one are they? SARS-CoV-1 or 2? Well, they call it the chimeric SARS-CoV-2 uh, base spike. So that makes me think that they're talking about the COSTA-2 within SARS-CoV, sort of getting at the fact that, um, well, as Rich said, hmm. that there isn't some sort of you know dramatic decrease when you make this yeah, chimera. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's yeah. it's more infectious. Yeah, in right. the chimera, not less. Yeah, actually, the, yeah, they do the they do the head to head comparison in this experiment with full length or the chimeras, and they get right. get similar results basically. Right. All right. The final set of experiments. They say, okay, uh, we know that SARS CoV two has gone from humans to wild animals and animals have their own coronaviruses. Uh, and, you know, we now see that there are ACE2 binding uh, coronas outside of Asia. So could recombination uh, with some of these viruses be a problem? So they say, to, we're going to try and mimic a potential COSTA2 recombinant. So they have their VSV pseudotypes uh, and there's SARS-CoV-2 spike with the RBD from Costa viruses. So this would be a theoretical, you know, recombinant that could arise if SARS-CoV-2 had infected an animal with Costa, right? Um, so these uh, these viruses are infectious in two nine three cells that produce uh, ACE2, and then they ask. How do, how do antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 recognize uh, this um, these chimeric spikes? So first, they have a monoclonal antibody, bamlanivimab, which is an RBD-specific monoclonal antibody. And this, of course, neutralizes pseudotypes with SARS-CoV-2. But SARS-CoV-2 with the COSTA-2 RBD is resistant to neutralization, uh, and it's probably not surprising because it wouldn't take much to make it resistant. And I'm sure they're quite divergent, right? In fact, on a phylogenetic tree, they're in different branches. So I'm not surprised at that result. Uh, so then they took serum from vaccinated individuals. People got either Moderna or Pfizer. 
vaccine, uh, similar trend, SARS-CoV-2 spike easily neutralized, the pseudotype that is, but the COSTA recombinant resistant to neutralization. So that's interesting because those sera ought to contain antibodies to that are all over the spike protein, but they're just looking at neutralization. So they're probably looking uh, almost exclusively at antibodies that bind the RBD. So that makes sense again. Now, I don't know how many doses. I would guess these people mainly had two doses. Right. But you remember, if you get a third dose, you broaden the right. neutralization. Right. It could include this. That could be interesting, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the, this COSTA RBD is 60% similar with uh, SARS-CoV-2. That's, that's quite different. Yeah. And right. actually, what kind of blows my mind is that with that fairly low level of similarity, you're still binding the ACE2 receptor. Yeah. Uh, and it makes me want to see structures to see what, you know, uh, what what's doing the binding and whether or not those uh, residues are conserved in some fashion. Though the other thing I'm doing here as we're talking about this is I'm looking through all these graphs and realizing that all of these binding studies are reported on a log scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, for example, in 293s, the, the uh, full-length spike, I mean, probably one of the best experiments is uh, full-length spike in 293s with ACE2 without protease. Okay, so... Or mm -hmm. with protease, either one, but without protease, um, you know, uh, cost of two is, if you look closely at the scale, is less than 10% of SARS CoV 1. Okay. Uh, and if mm -hmm. you look at the with protease, it's hard to kind of figure it out. It's probably 90 whatevers versus mm, two or 300. So it's half. A mm -hmm. third, something like that. So By the way, it's binding ACE2. It's not terrific. Yeah. Right. And I was actually, while we, you were looking for that, I was looking to see what it, they told us about those vaccinated individuals. Um, and they just, we just know how many of them there are. Uh, we know nothing about anything else about them, like how many doses they've received. So they say in the discussion that they got RBD specific vaccines. Remember, Pfizer made an RBD specific oh. vaccine. I didn't know that Moderna had put that in people. No, that's, I, that's, I, I, I don't no, think. No, I don't think so. No. They say no, here I, the serum we tested was from individuals vaccinated only with RBD specific vaccines from Moderna or Pfizer. That's huh. that, I don't think that's right. No, right? that can't be right. Yeah, that they would need to give us some more information than they do in the methods. And I don't think the I don't I don't think the Pfizer RBD vaccine uh, went into phase three trials, so they would have a limited number of people. I'm not yeah, sure it went into people at all. I think it got uh, got trashed in uh, preclinical, right? I don't recall. Yeah. I don't know, but anyway. So what we have a Costa one and two one Costa one is probably binding some human receptor other than ACE two. Costa two seems to bind ACE two. Uh, whether that would be enough to to bootstrap a SARS-CoV-2 infection, we don't know. <laughs> Someone's going to have to do that in a BSL-3. Uh, but their their bottom line is that maybe we should make broader <laughs> sarbecovirus vaccines just to prevent, just to protect us against any, you know, RBD or other sequences coming out of uh, animals. And that's not a bad idea. The broader, yeah, yeah. the better. Go ahead, Brian. Do, do Do we, you know... Also want to think about what if it isn't a recombinant, um, you know, oh, sure. yeah. in theory, um, different emerging viruses emerge from a, from a number of different reasons. Um, you know, such a vaccine would not just protect us against recombinants, but could help us make sure that COSTA or some other mystery Sarbeco virus couldn't emerge because we'd vaccinated in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that it shows is that there's... Uh, probably a plethora of coronaviruses out there that, you know, in terms of sort of 
broad phylogeny, you wouldn't expect to have the same kind of potential as the SARS-CoV viruses. And yet uh, they contain um, spikes that have a receptor binding domain that have the potential to infect human cells or at least uh, uh, yeah, attach and, and enter human cells. So th that to me says that there's uh, probably more potential for spillover than you might otherwise realize. Yeah. Yep. I'm also interested in this thing about having low homology but still binding ACE2. I'd love to see the structures on a number of these. I think the bottom line is we need to <laughs> we need to do more wildlife sampling and yeah. see what the heck is out mm -hmm. there because it, the range could be broader than we know. And if you know, if you want to make a broadly active Sarbeco vaccine, you need to kind of know what broad means, right? Yeah. yeah. We don't. We don't. You know, we have field, two field work, right, Vincent? Field work, yeah. Maybe maybe the pandemic will uh, have the effect of uh, stimulating some more of that kind of research or, uh, in particular, funding for more of that kind of research. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're curious about what we're just talking about, when we did a TWIV at Galveston, it's, uh, you know, we had older people who had been around and they said, you know, uh, field work is key and nobody wants to do it anymore. It's hard. You have to go away for a long time, you know. It's hard to get funding support for it. But clearly, uh, our lack of knowledge is getting us. So that's key. Um, so we have a, a second paper, Science Immunology. A modified vaccine, Ankara vaccine, expressing spike in nucleocapsid proteins protects rhesus macaques against SARS-CoV-2 Delta infection. Uh, this is uh, out of a number of groups at uh, Emory University, uh, MIT, Harvard, and Harvard, uh, and um, um, North University of North Carolina, Louisiana, Louisiana State University. We have two co authors, Nanda Kishore Ruthu and Sailaja Gangadhara, and the last author is Rama Rao Amara. So why was... I interested in this. I thought it would be interesting to talk about a different vaccine platform, and I could ask Rich to talk about modified vaccinia Ankara. I know he would love to do that. You got it. Uh, and um, oh, in the end, I don't think the results are as good as the one we discussed on TWIV 867, where they had an ad-vectored intranasal vaccine delivering spike nucleocapsid and uh, RNA polymerase. But I didn't know that ahead of time. And so you're going to hear about it. So um, they uh, apparently, this group has um, previously developed a, a modified Ankara, vac vaccine, Ankara-based uh, spike SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And let me, before we get to that, and I'll ask uh, Rich to talk about it. Uh, they say, I have, a, I have some issues with some of the things they say in this paper. For example, the incomplete protection provided by current vaccines, particularly against variants of concern, warrants the development of vaccines with more durable immunity. I mean, I think you, you can always do better, but I think the protection is pretty darn good with at least mRNA vaccines against, and one of the things they never distinguish is if they're talking about infection or disease in this paper, and I think that's not right, right? We are way beyond that in this uh, pandemic. Um, so I think we're doing pretty well with an ancestral spike based mRNA vaccine against Omicron. If you get three doses, you're pretty well protected against severe disease. Uh, but nevertheless, I think a vaccine, as they say, that has more T, T cell epitopes might be broadly, more broadly active and so forth. And here's something that really puzzled me. And I want to, I, I could be wrong. And, and Brianne, you tell me. So they're talking about T cells destroying virus particles. They never mention killing virus infected cells. So it has always been my understanding that T cells recognize infected cells by virtue of a viral peptide displayed in an MHC molecule, right? So yes. virus particles don't have MHC molecules. So do, does that happen? Do CTLs destroy virus particles? And if they do, is that an MHC independent process? I am not aware of any specific ways that a CTL could uh, 
directly destroy virus particles. Um, I, I thought you were going to say, of course, Vincent, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I could imagine, you know, ways that we could indirectly say, well, a CD4 could help us make better antibodies or a cell could, right, right. It could uh, en enhance some other immune response that could uh, get virus particles. And so in that way, it might be indirect. But I don't know of any ways that okay. you could directly have a CTL destroy virus particles. No, they say T cells can provide localized protection in the mucosa and also prevent new infections by destroying incoming virions before they can replicate. I just don't know where that's coming from. What happened to killing infected cells, right? That's uh, the <laughs> I, I have never heard of a CTL doing that. Oh, my. Okay. Uh, could there be any sort of uh, T-cell involvement, not just uh, CTLs, any sort of T-cell involvement? I mean, I'm thinking about uh, complement. Making right? uh, cytokines right. like, like right. CD4s, I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying to think about whether... Complement so, might be, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're, so there is a, there are a couple of molecules that are cytotoxic, um, that are made by some CTLs and that are made by some CD4s. And I'm trying to think if I know of any of them directly lysing viruses. Um, kind of like you're saying with complement, but I'm thinking of some other antimicrobial peptides. Right. I can't name any, maybe with the possible exception of one called granulysin, um, that could lyse viral particles, but I will not say that there definitely are none. Okay. All right. So um, what they do, previously they've, they take their modified vaccine Ankara vector with spike, and they had shown that it was immunogenic in mice and protects against infection in rhesus macaques. And they wanted to modify it, which is what they do. They, they add the nucleocapsid protein. They also inactivate the furin cleavage site, which is interesting. And, and then they're all, they all have the two prolines to, to lock it in a prefusion confirmation and they want to do this in uh, macaques and try some different inoculation. So we'll talk about that. But first, Rich, give us the lowdown on MVA. Okay. Excuse me. So MVA stands for modified vaccine Ankara. Uh, so we have over the last couple of, uh, uh, last several episodes, several times mentioned vaccine virus. Uh, as the virus that was used to vaccinate people against smallpox. Um, and it's related to other similar pox viruses, cowpox, horsepox, uh, et cetera. Uh, and back in the early 80s, yes, early 80s, people figured out that you could engineer vaccinia, pox viruses in general, vaccinia virus in particular, and stick uh, genes, non-viral genes into it under the control of a virus promoter uh, and uh, the products from those genes would be expressed during a pox virus infection. And this can be used uh, in a number of different ways, one of which uh, is to use as a recombinant vectored vaccine, similar to the adenovirus vaccine. And, the, and this was the first of its kind. Um, and so the idea was, look, we've got a virus that's been used for hundreds of years as a vaccine. Why don't we just piggyback another antigen, uh, in on top of that and vaccinate people with that and make them immune to another disease. And there's been, uh, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of such recombinants made for a bunch of different diseases <clears throat> over decades. Okay. So the notion of vaccinia as a recombinant vector is, uh, well-established. Uh, the one thing we need to add to this is what's MVA and how does that relate to sort of um, original vaccinia. MVA, so uh, in Germany, in the uh, sort of late stages of the uh, smallpox eradication campaign, they had their own uh, vaccinia variety called Ankara that they used in their vaccination program. Uh, like all such viruses, uh, it was prone to uh, side effects. I mean, that immunization, you know, by its very nature, this, this scarification where you scratch some virus into the skin, it gives a blistering lesion. It can give you axillary adenitis where your lymph nodes swell up. It can give you, uh, you know, headaches and all sorts of 
unpleasant things. And in fact, with vaccine in general, I don't know about Ankara in particular, in primary vaccinees, there's about a one in a million chance that you'll die. Okay. Secondary vaccinees, um, uh, it's the probability that you're going to die from it is much lower, probably mostly because you killed all the susceptible people in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> so there was motivation to make a uh, version of uh, vaccinia that would be uh, less prone to side effects. And, you know, as is typically done with these, this was passaged in chick cells, I think mostly, maybe some other cell types as well, like 500 times. Uh, and so that becomes modified vaccinia Ankara. This has been also studied for decades, sequenced, all of its properties figured out. And it is dead, dead, dead. It has big deletions in it uh, and is so compromised that it only grows on a very restricted number of cell lines. The chick cells that it was, primary chick embryo cells that it was selected on. And then <clears throat> I think BHKs, uh, they, they seem to be a very permissive cell line for lots of these types of viruses. I think they lack an interferon response, among other things, uh, and there's uh, other things with them that make them permissive. And they talk about a different cell line here that, for all I know, was uh, derived from one of these others and engineered specifically to grow MVA because MVA now, okay, it's so um, crippled that you can't even do the vaccination by scarification. They ordinarily do. You have to inject it. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't replicate in humans basically at all. It just gets in and I think it replicates a little bit of DNA and makes early gene products. And these are all under, uh, early, uh, actually combined, combined early late, uh, promoters. So you get a lot of protein expression. So they make very little virus protein. Uh, they make a little virus DNA, I believe, but they don't make infectious. They don't, replicate in humans well enough to actually make new copies of the virus, but they make a lot of proteins at the same time. MVA is now, I would say, the third generation smallpox vaccine uh, that I believe has been stockpiled here and there. And uh, if now we have uh, a smallpox outbreak, chances are you won't get regular vaccinia. You'll get, uh, by scarification, you'll get MVA. And it's also... Um, uh, used as a vector to do all of this. It's now the go-to pox virus vector to do all this kind of stuff. So, um, Rich, in, in the process of um, making, uh, having all those deletions, um, am I correct in recalling that this basically removes all of the kind of immune modulatory genes? And so, you know, the immune system can destroy this virus quite well and this virus is not um, evading immunity um, so it may be pretty immunogenic compared to, say, vaccinia? You are correct. Uh, the, the gene organization in these pox viruses is really interesting. It has all of the, what you might call housekeeping nuts and bolts genes that are required for replication and assembly clustered in the middle of the genome. And that's very highly conserved throughout uh, pox viruses. And then on the ends, either the right or left end of this linear double-stranded DNA uh, genome is uh, all of the sort of uh, host range uh, and pathogenicity genes, many of which probably the majority of which have to do with evading the immune response, both the innate response uh, and the uh, adaptive response. And so if you carry this thing from one chick culture to another chick culture uh, and let it replicate in the absence of almost any sort of immune response, uh, the virus can throw all that stuff away. And it's thrown away, you know, um, uh, uh, many deca. Uh, many decakilobases, 10, 20, 30 kilobases of DNA out of a, you know, it's, I, it's uh, like 20% of the genome or something like that is just gone <laughs> because you don't need it anymore. So you're absolutely right. So in addition to MVA, uh, also canary pox viruses have been used as vectors, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're different enough from the human pox viruses in terms of what they have to yeah. or the uh, other mammalian pox viruses in terms of what they have to contend with in terms of uh, uh, immune response so that, uh, in, in effect, uh, they're very similar in their properties to MVA. And actually, hmm. so one of the places where the recombinant pox viruses have had the most really commercial utility is in veterinary vaccines. 
So when you take your cat or your dog in to get vaccinated with rabies, chances are they're getting a canary pox recombinant with uh, the rabies glycoprotein cloned into it. Mm. That's very common. So this brings to mind Enzo Paoletti. You who bet. Developed, I was thinking hey, of old Enzo, I, yep. I just looked him up. I didn't realize he died in 2018. Enzo is gone, yep. He's gone. He was... Uh, My age. Wow. Yeah, 1943. Uh, okay, a little older than me. Huh. Yeah, I met him. He was a character. Yep. He was a character. <laughs> and, and Enzo really gets... Uh, there were... Uh, three different laboratories that simultaneously figured out that you could uh, engineer pox viruses in culture. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was mine, uh, but mm -hmm. for a different purpose. I was doing marker rescue to map mutants, okay? But the principles are the same. But Enzo is the guy who figured out that you could uh, clone foreign genes into the virus. I think he deserves the lion's share of the credit. And um, I think one of these, I think canary pox has been used in HIV vaccine exactly. trials, yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So they have, pre as I said, they previously have a spike MVA, which uh, is just in preclinical work. I don't know who's developing it and, and if it's going to go into people or what, but they decided to make a, a different version. As I said, they inactivate the furin cleavage site by changing some of these amino acids, and then they add the N gene into the uh, same vector. So you can put multiple, these vectors can take a lot of genes, right? Yeah. Yeah. In particular, MBA that, uh, you know, there don't seem to be any really serious packaging constraints. That is, you can add a lot of DNA even to the regular virus. But now that you've uh, ripped out, I don't know, at least 10% of the genome, you yeah. got, uh, you got room for all kinds of stuff. And that's one of the advantages of these vectors. And I want to add, um, uh, just two more thoughts. First of all, they're putting spike and N in. And my my sort of react my first reaction to that is the conversations we had very early on during a pandemic, when we wondered whether oh man they're focusing entirely on spike and <laughs> all these vaccines is that good yeah. enough? Yeah. Shouldn't there be a broader uh, representation of antigens? And so here are some experiments. It turns out that the spike vaccines. Uh, work really well. Yeah. Um, but it's still a relevant question as to whether they might work better or differently if you added another antigen. And I also want to recall a, a um, conversation that I had with Bernie Moss, uh, sort of the uh, premier pox virologist um, historically and even currently, uh, on he's made a coronavirus or participated in the uh, creation of a coronavirus vaccine uh, just with S. And I had an opportunity to talk to him about this. And I said, why not S and something else? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, how are we going to, S works so well. How are we going to be able to tell whether S plus N is any better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So right. keep that in mind as we read this. Yes. In fact, you'd probably have to do um, some of the T cell assays that uh, we talked about in a previous uh, TWIV when we talked about some of the T cell assays. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanna, we'll get to that, but they do some here, but it's not clear what they mean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing is, let, let me bring this up. So we have a spike based vaccines and, you know, they generate neutralizing antibodies and then then selects for variants that evade, that, that are not neutralized well, right? The inclusion of N probably wouldn't change that, right? Because yeah. you don't make neutralizing antibodies yeah. right. against N. But maybe they'd give you a broader T cell response. You know, uh, even the spike-based vaccines are still give you good T cell responses and you have good protection against disease, which is presumably from uh, the T cell response. As we've talked about many times and we did that nice... Re uh, commentary last week, Brianne, right, about yep. T cells. And I just wonder, yeah, if you include N, you're going to have more T cell epitopes, but how would you, you know, if you got 90% protection against <laughs> severe, moderate, severe disease and death, yeah, it's hard to demonstrate much yeah. better than that. How do you know? And, yep. No, but I do not think it would change the variant uh, selection because spike is there, right? So anyway, they want to know if adding if modifying the furin cleavage site, adding N makes any difference. So they do some immunogenicity and efficacy first in mice 
And they compare the S with the S and the furin cleavage site change. They have a, a you, you prime on week zero, you would do a boost on week four, and then you uh, look at antibody responses. And then the furin, mucking with the furin cleavage site gives you uh, eightfold higher neutralization activity. And they're, they're looking at ancestral SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so I, d I don't know why that would be, but it looks better, right? Um, then they challenged these mice intranasally uh, with their mouse with mouse adapted uh, coronavirus, um, and both sets of mice have complete protection. They have no weight loss and no detectable virus in the lungs. This is by PCR, right? I, I think of that uh, uh, eliminating the furin cleavage site as just uh, an additional method of uh, stabilizing this yeah, thing, or prefusion so. state. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, eliminating any other kind of reactions that yeah. could happen um, to get that out of the state. And actually, <laughs> while we're paused here, I want to uh, before I forget uh, acknowledge we were talking about Enzo Paletti and mm -hmm. the recombinant pox viruses. Uh, his sidekick was Dennis Panicali. Panicali, okay? right, right. Uh, who was uh, really, I think, critical uh, in this whole thing. Dennis is still around. Hi, Dennis. I hope uh, this gets around to you sometime. Yes, and, he was He was doing some of the HIV work that uh, Vincent mentioned. I wish, you know, one of these days I'm going to look up there. So just a, uh, Enzo had a way of accumulating Italians in his laboratory. <laughs> and there's this one classic paper from his uh, uh, laboratory that has like five or six different authors on it, all with names that end in a vowel, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, it's just fun to run through the authors from that paper. They must have had interesting conversations. That's a, uh, that's a uh, Jersey Boys uh, reference there. Yeah, Panicali was from Italy. Yes, he was. No, I'm sorry, Paletti. Paletti for sure. I don't know about uh, Penny. I think I think uh, Enzo both? was as well. Yeah, yeah. I think Enzo's. I think I'm not entirely sure. Somebody can uh, correct me on this. I think uh, initially Italian was Enzo's first language. What was the Jersey Boy reference? Uh, let me see. Uh, with the vowels, uh, names yes, ending. Yes, uh, Frankie Valley. His uh, his uh, real name was something different, and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, he uh, changed his name to Valley, and uh, yeah. uh, there's a scene with him and a woman in a pizza joint at a table where he tells her that he's done this and he's going to spell it V A L L Y, and she goes off on him about how uh, you can't the Y is not a respectable vowel, and that uh, <laughs> if you're going to use an if you're going to have an Italian name, it's got into a vowel. Okay, it's a great his, scene. His name was Francesco <laughs> Castelluccio. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! And wasn't your daughter involved in Jersey Boys? Yeah, she was the uh, assistant uh, lighting designer I, for the Broadway production. And has, I saw it. I saw and, it. It was very good. And has done uh, and has done a lot of the. Uh, uh, the touring shows as, uh, as well. Yeah. When you, if you go to Jersey Boys, uh, one of the professional productions, uh, pay attention to the spotlights because that was her job. Okay. She did a bunch of other stuff as well, but she actually designed the, the, uh, the lighting for the spotlights. So, um, I will pay attention. I, I, last in December, we saw, um, Moulin Rouge. Okay. And I thought of your daughter because I don't know what they did with the lights, but they have these scenes where someone is singing and then they, they make a gesture and all the lights go out at once. <laughs> it's so amazing. Yeah. And you didn't even, often you hear the switches in the back and you didn't even hear that this time. They yeah. must have changed to non-mechanical switches. But do you know when the whole thing goes, all, every light at the same time, it was so cool. I've never seen that before. Yeah, the lighting designer uh, for, oh no, I'm going to blank on his name. Howell, Howell Binkley was the lighting <laughs> designer for um, uh, Jersey Boys. And he mm -hmm. kind of mentored Sarah, uh, starting with that. And, well, no, actually, the Jersey Boys started out, they did their pre-Broadway run at La Jolla uh, Playhouse. 
uh, when Sarah was a graduate student at UCSD, which is, and they, uh, you know, uh, parasitized the graduate students from UCSD to set up these uh, productions. That's how she got into Jersey Boys. And that's how she uh, uh, met Howell. But Howell did the lights for In the Heights also mm -hmm. and for Hamilton. Okay. Oh, cool. So he's got two Tonys in there. No. Uh, and you watch nice. those shows and uh, the lighting is just absolutely spectacular. It's so much a part of the whole thing. Yeah, I, I have a show that I saw um, this year that had lighting that I still can't figure out how they did it. So if she can explain <laughs> some tricks to me, that would be really helpful. Uh, what's, the, what's the show? <laughs> the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll see if I can remember that and ask her about it. <laughs> So that so wasn't that, a digression or anything. <laughs> yeah. How did we uh, get on to that? Panicali oh, and <laughs> Frankie Valli and lighting. <laughs> yeah. Jersey Boys. <laughs> that was what, a, what uh, fun. a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, fun. So then they say, would this, uh, few, would this uh, furin altered spike uh, neutralize the beta variant? Um, so the, you have about a seven fold, seven and a half fold reduction in neutralization uh, of of sera made by their uh, their original uh, MVAS against beta. So then they vaccinate mice with this furin S, furin altered S, and they challenge them with beta, and they're very well protected. They uh, they develop. Uh, no disease, very transient weight loss, no lung pathology, and no detectable viral RNA. So they say, yeah, the furin site expands the protection against um, beta, at least. We'll get it, we'll get into delta later. So that's all in mice, and um, uh, now they want to look in macaques, and they want to try different ways of immunizing. And, you know, one of the things I was excited about, they, they talk about needle-free, and I thought they were going to use vaccine patches, but they don't. Yeah, they do. I no. really am looking for <laughs> vaccine patches. Please, somebody out there, let's do this. So, but they're doing, um, they're doing intramuscular, uh, sublingual, and buckle. Now... So what uh, I looked all over the methods to see if I could figure out exactly how they do that. Somehow you apply virus under the tongue or to the cheek, right, not involving I mean. a needle. Yeah. Right. Uh, and given the properties of, um, it's going to turn out that that doesn't work real well. No. It and given work the well. properties of MVA that I've already described, I'm not too surprised. Right. I think the goal here is that people want to look at getting mucosal responses. Yeah. With the hopes that, you know, this could yeah. someday maybe protect you well in the nose or the respiratory tract um, to better prevent infection. Yeah, um, yeah. But this is maybe not uh, ideal. Uh, but the, the, uh, uh, thank you for trying. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. fine. You have to try. Yeah. But you the know. intranasal with those ad vectors seem to work really well. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know why they didn't try intranasal. Um yeah, I can't see people taking a vaccine under their tongue. That's just <laughs> intranasal is easy. You spray it up their nose. I don't know. Uh, anyway, you, know, you can you can lyophilize you can lyophilize yeah, vaccinia. Yeah. So you could stick it in a capsule. Yeah. A lozenge under your tongue. Whatever. There's I suppose that's better than a needle can. for many yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. You have to try it. All right, so they have their recombinant with N and this furin cleavage site altered S, and that's what they put into the macaques. And remember, macaques are expensive and precious, so they can't use a lot. Um, in some cases, the control is one animal, and that's always a problem because you have a lot of animal-to-animal -animal variation. And I would argue that you shouldn't use macaques because you can't use enough to get... <laughs> good numbers and you probably don't have to they don't develop severe disease either uh, neither do the mice anyway uh, they do all these and then they challenge them this time they're they, they have a prime and a boost zero and four weeks they challenge at uh, eight weeks and they're challenging with delta now and uh, they go through a lot of characterization you know i have a lot of trouble reading these vaccine papers because they take a graph 
and try and describe it in the text. And it takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> if you just look at the graph, it's a lot faster, but you can't just publish the graph. You have to comment on it. Um, but anyway, that they find is that the intramuscular immunization, you get better antibody response in both the serum and the mucosal compared to these oral vaccinations. And they also cross-react with uh, other variants of concern. Uh, they looked at alpha and beta and delta. So, you know, even though I am for a respiratory infection seems counterintuitive, it really does work. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, and the, 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 it worked better than the, than the attempt at a mucosal immunization. Now, yeah. if you actually did this intranasally, you might get a different <clears throat> result. Uh, the next section is called intramuscular vaccination induces polyfunctional antibodies. Gee, you may ask, what does that mean? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not only do the antibodies neutralize uh, various variants, right? But they have non-neutralizing activities. I thought Brian would be very excited about I this. I was very excited. <laughs> and you can explain some of these. So antibody dependent complement deposition. Yes. So go ahead. So the FC portion of the antibody um, can start a complement cascade. Um, so we can start basically sticking complement proteins on the virus that may help to inactivate the virus. Could, you could also have the antibodies binding uh, antigen in the plasma, me plasma membrane and also fix complement that way. Is that right? You, you could. Um, I think of that being a little bit less effective because so many of your R cells have complement um, inhibitors okay. um, to inhibit complement uh, activity right. on their surface. Then we have antibody-dependent phagocytosis. Mm -hmm. So I guess the FC is binding to like a macrophage. So the FC is binding to an FC receptor on a macrophage yeah. and getting uh, leading to the virus being phagocytosed. This is also called opsonization, or I learned it the hard way as an undergraduate as like putting butter on something to make it more likely to get eaten. <laughs> we have <laughs> antibody-dependent neutrophil phagocytosis. That's a new one for me. It's the same thing, just neutrophils, neutrophils. instead of monocytes. <laughs> and then antibody-dependent NK cell activation. So this is more likely what would happen if the antibody is uh, binding to an antigen on an infected cell. Okay. Um, now that NK cell could come and kill that infected cell. So it's something we used to call ADCC, right? It is basically ADCC, yes. Okay. So they, they have different assays for each of these activities, right? Right. Which they do. Uh, and they find that they're all higher. They, they see them all and they're higher in the intramuscular groups, Right. So that's what they mean by polyfunctional uh, an, uh, antibody responses. They have all of these other non-neutralizing activities. Um, yes, so I am, again, wins. They also looked at T cells uh, in uh, these animals. By um, They take blood mononuclear cells. They add peptide pools to them, and they measure... Responses. This is an assay we've talked about before. Alessandro Sette likes to use that kind of assay, right? So we have peptides from S and N, and then you can measure the response. Um, they use intracellular cytokine staining to measure the response. ICS. That's one of the assays mm -hmm. in that in that um, yes. paper that we did last week. Yeah, and so they see both CD4 and CD8 cells that respond to peptides from S and N. They say the markers suggest a TH1 bias. That's yes. for CTLs, right? Um, so TH1 is a helper T is a type of helper T cell. It's a mm -hmm. type of CD4. Um, but they are making some cytokines that can help CTLs right. and that are um, generally more appropriate in an antiviral response as opposed to say the, the TH2, which is something that you see with allergies. Or something like that. Um, they say that the the magnitude of these CD4 and CD8 responses are similar between the oral and the intramuscular groups. That TH1, TH2 thing, um, if I understand, correct me if I've got it wrong here, uh, 
uh, is relevant among other things because uh, um, before people started paying close attention to that, there were some vaccines made that were skewed towards uh, TH2. And that's that can be uh, even worse than not good. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you have uh, your vaccine uh, in some cases with some uh, microbes, if your vaccine is inducing a TH2 response, you might get some immunopathology. Um, and so it can be important that you are looking at a TH1 response. Um, I remember in some of the early papers looking at, uh, I think it was Pfizer's paper, they show a little bit of data and show that they were getting a TH1 response and they mention the importance of that because of um, some TH2 um, immunopathology that they cite. And if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, manipulating that response has a lot to do with sort of uh, what vector you use and what adjuvant you use. So using a vector and using an appropriate adjuvant helps you get the response you want. Is that correct? It, it seems like the vector, the adjuvant, and also the um, location of administration. Ah, okay. So uh, what? Uh, give me a, some examples of location. So like doing IM versus sublingual versus okay. IN, okay. intranasal, something like that. Well, they conclude that the N, including N, it may expand the T cell breadth, but they didn't really compare it to without N. So, <laughs> well, yes, this was one of my gripes uh, with the paper, though, as you've already pointed out. You know, we're talking about macaques here, but in yeah. in, in neither macaques or mice do they do a head-to-head -head comparison yeah. of the spike alone with the spike plus uh, plus N, right? They do spike versus furin cleavage spike, but yeah, not N, yeah. Then they um, they take a little divergence here. I'm not sure. They had the data, so I think they wanted to. They had to. the data. They did, you know, I think they needed this as, as uh, background. Uh, they had the data, and I'm glad they published it. That's good. They have a, so they've infected these uh, macaques with Delta, and they want to know what accounts, can they learn about what accounts for the uh, increased fitness of Delta with respect to previous... <clears throat> Variants, And they say, you know, in people, it's hard to do because you have population immunity and you don't know how much inoculum everybody gets. So it's really hard to make conclusions about mechanisms. And I'm glad they say it because, you know, there are some pundits who make conclusions anyway <laughs> out there. You shouldn't. So they're able to um, compare reproduction in the upper and lower airways of these macaques um, by, in fact, with either Delta or the ancestral virus. And so the big problem here is they don't measure infectious virus. They're doing PCR. And I really don't know why you would do such an expensive and hard experiment and not measure infectious virus. Because we know, we've talked about other papers that say PCR is a, not a great surrogate for uh, infectivity. So they make conclusions based on it, which I have a lot of problems with. They, they say that Delta reproduces high to higher levels in the upper airway compared to the ancestral um, and not, not so in the lung. But that higher load may not translate to infectivity, right? So if you right. want to make conclusions about saying we're shedding more sooner and that may account for better fitness, you better measure infectivity, I think. So uh, that's my issue here. I'm sorry if I... I'm negative, but do infectivity, for gosh sakes. <laughs> you went you went to such extents to use a precious resource. Okay, now we go back to immunology. And they're um, going to do a challenge with Delta and mac macaque. So these animals have been <clears throat> immunized intramuscularly and uh, buccally. And um, then they challenged them at eight weeks. So it's four weeks after the second dose. Um, and this is just, is this comparing the, is it just the spike and vaccine alone? Or are they comparing it to something? I think they're just doing that alone. I think so. Yes. They compare control to control animals. Yeah. And right. So <laughs> they have lower virus loads as you might expect. Um, and they say the inch... In the intramuscular group, the animals showed profound viral control <laughs> below the level of detection of 
the PCR. So, okay, this is a Delta challenge in, with an ancestral spike. So it's working quite well in them. Um, so they say this vaccine, both IM and, and buccal roots, gives you uh, control of reproduction in the lower airway compared to controls. The sublingual root, no protection at all. So forget about a lozenge under your tongues, folks. And within 10 days, all the vaccinated rhesus macaques are negative by PCR. I am, and buckle works in the upper and lower airways for uh, that, uh, that other, for Delta. Okay, finally, the, the last section is another one I have an issue with. I'm sorry. They say it's called immune correlates for protection. Against what? <laughs> Infection? <laughs> Disease? Both? They don't say. But I think they're looking at infection because that's what they're measuring. And the cacs don't get really serious disease anyway. Um, so they basically say we look at all of these function of antibodies and make a correlation with, um, with, with viral loads. So they're really looking at the correlates of protection against infection, right? With respect to T cells, we observed a moderate but significant inverse association between spike-specific interferon gamma positive CD4 T cells in the hilar lymph nodes and day two viral nodes in the nose. <laughs> Very specific. So, so uh, inverse correlation: more T cells, less viral load. That's right. It's good. Yes. It's a good thing. Yeah. Where's the hilar lymph node, um, Brianne? Do you remember? I do not know the hilar lymph node. Let's look it up. Okay. Hilar lymph node is in the area where the bronchus enters the lung. So I guess okay. just below your sternum, more or less, right? Sure. And you can't. That would be a hard one to isolate. Well, you have to, you have <laughs> yeah. to dissect the animals, right? Right. But it would be one that you would look at for draining the the respiratory tree, I guess. Right? Yeah, these uh, challenges have been done intranasally or intratracheally. Yeah, right. tracheally. So that makes sense. And they say basically multiple uh, antibody functions contribute to protection against infection, against a, a heterologous virus. Um, but he said that this is the problem with this because they're, they're assaying these animals four weeks after the boost where we know all these antibody levels are still quite high, right? So yeah. it, it's fine that they protect, but the real key is if you waited, what, a couple of months, I don't know what the time course is in a rhesus macaque, waited six months and then challenge what happened. I know they're going to get infected and they're going to reproduce, but how, did the, how does the disease go? But the, they don't develop very serious disease. So Well, and you make a point there that I think was one of the things that I was sort of a little sad about when I was reading this paper, because when I read the title, Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I said, oh, so we're going to see that this uh, vaccine gives us perhaps greater breadth. It protects against Delta and ancestral, you know, better. Yeah. I, I just felt the way that they were spinning it about Delta made me think that, you know, we were really going to see this difference in breadth. And then when they get to the challenge study, they don't actually challenge with homologous versus heterologous yeah, right. virus. Yeah. They just challenge with heterologous virus and say it works. Um, and so I want to know, well, is, does it actually work better or worse than something else? And, you know, is is this giving you this heterologous protection that you didn't get uh, previously? Yeah. Um, and they yeah. don't really do the experiments to show that. And, and the, the thing which I don't mention, which is very important, is that we know now that <laughs> if you get a third dose of mRNA vaccine, you have really good protection against severe disease and death with Omicron using the ancestral spike, right? That still blows yep. my mind. Well, we don't need That's any of this. That's going to continue to blow my mind. <laughs> we don't need <laughs> any of this here because bike alone, third dose is good. And so um, we know that antibody levels can go way down and you still get good protection because the studies are now out showing that six months after that, that boost. So this is all kind of, much of this is kind of irrelevant, unfortunately, because um, you don't need to add for, for getting that heterologous protection, all you need is a boost, apparently. Yeah, it's, it blows my mind that you can do a, a boost and you get it. 
Oh, well, wow. so I think the um, one of the main contributions about this is that uh, intramuscular looks really good, at least with this vaccine, right? Yeah, yeah. despite whatever uh, nits we have picked in this paper. I'm glad they did this stuff and I'm glad it's out there because these are, they're addressing questions that we've been asking over and over. Yeah. And um, so they do make the point saying, you know, it's good to make different vaccines because there are many parts of the world that need them. Um, they say here, it, uh, availability of multiple COVID vaccines is good. You know, we need to get vaccines to poor and middle income countries. And I thought, why don't we just buy more mRNA vaccine and give it to them? Well, I think that in the long term, I agree that having more vaccine types is really important. So last week, we talked about that paper that still is blowing my mind about the lipid component yeah. <laughs> and um, this, the IL-1 and potentially how that uh, is related to side effects. And so there are some people who um, really have a bad side effect profile yeah, with the mRNA true. vaccines. That's true. Um, perhaps we see a different profile with these MVA vaccines. Um, perhaps um, if we were to do even uh, further fine characterization of the CD8s or um, other responses, we would see some differences in immune responses. And then we could determine which of those immune responses might be favorable. Um, so I think it's good that we're developing sort of diverse vaccines and seeing what they do. Um, right now, it's not clear to me that um, this vaccine is uh, going to be better than the ones that we have. But I do think that we should continue working on trying to figure out some of these basic immune principles and what can give us uh, different uh, types of immune responses. I'm sounds, sorry, like just looking sounds like there's some TWIV episodes here I need to listen to. Uh, yeah, that there's, paper there's, was so cool. The, the, the yeah, one paper is very cool. Yeah, listen to the TWIV of, with Brienne and me. That was really good. Okay, so the, I'm looking it. at the vaccine tracker, see what, what's up with MVA. Here's one study. Uh, what does this damn line mean? It's uh, it's used as a boost along with um, an adenovirus vector in one and another. MVA-based SARS-CoV-2 City of Hope Medical Center. That's in phase one. All right, so that's going into people. MVAS is at the German Center for Infection Research. That's in phase one. Um, MVA. Another one is at... Uh, Preclinical in the University of Texas medical branch, another one in Spain in preclinical, another one in Spain in preclinical. Uh, so they're a bunch, but they're early on. I don't know how what the likelihood is that they're going to get anywhere, but we will see. Okay, let's um, let's let's pick and choose. Um, some uh, uh, email here. First one, um, because I don't want to do too many, but one is good since we've been talking about that. Brianne, there's one from Sonali there. Can you read okay. that one? Sure. Um, uh, yes. And this is, uh, in fact, I was reading these earlier and there's another one about that same paper below. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Sonali writes, hi, Vincent and Brianne. Thanks for your recent episode on aisle one, aisle one, a induction post mRNA vaccination and big kudos to all that you and the entire TWIV team do on a weekly basis to disseminate credible scientific information. It's not an easy task, but you do it so well. I enjoyed your musings about the potential use of anakinra, an IL-1 receptor antagonist, in patients with severe inflammatory responses following COVID-19 infection. As a rheumatologist, I have now been involved in the care of several patients who developed multi-system inflammatory syndrome in adults, MISA, following quote-unquote mild cases of COVID-19 infection. Unfortunately, all were in young unvaccinated patients. I thought you might be interested to know that we frequently reach for anakinra in these cases and that it has saved many of these critically ill patients in combination with high-dose steroids. 
It is also one of our go-to drugs in cases of macrophage activation syndrome, which clinically resembles MISA in many ways due to widespread cytokine release. I know that Daniel frequently gets listener emails about how various immunosuppressive drugs might affect the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccination. I would like to point out that the American College of Rheumatology has assembled a task force to provide guidance on this very topic. In these cases, it might be appropriate for the patient to consider holding their medications prior to and immediately after vaccination to maximize vaccine efficacy, but this decision should be made in conjunction with their physician. Thanks again for all you do. You're an inspiration. Um, and Sonali gives um, a link, um, particularly in a link to the American College of Rheumatology guidance for COVID vaccines. Cool. Very good cool. to know. Thank yep. you. Thank yeah, you. Definitely really good to know. Um, I remember seeing one study that um, didn't look at uh, look positive for Anna Kinra, and I was remember being sort of sad and surprised. Um, and so I'm glad to know that there are, it, it does seem to be having some uh, good effect here. All right. The other one on IL1 is from Jap, who writes, uh, Dear Twiv, thanks for a great collection of podcasts. A small nitpick regarding Twiv 882 while discussing IL1B processing it was mentioned that two signals are required for mature IL-1B. I haven't kept up with the literature, so perhaps the below references are outdated. However, I believe that while mice, most cells need two signals to produce mature IL-1B, it is not a general requirement. Specifically, it has been shown that human monocytes can secrete processed IL-1B after a single stimulation with TLO2 or TLO4 ligands, PAM3 cis, a synthetic molecule mimicking bacterial lipoprotein, and LPS, a component of the cell wall of gram negatives. Whether this is relevant in the setting of mRNA vaccinations is another matter, of course. And he provides two references. And I don't know, Brienne, but they just, in the paper, they said it needs two signaling. That's why we said that. Yeah. And yeah. So um, the first of the two papers that he references is actually a paper that I reference pretty frequently <laughs> in mm -hmm. my work. Um, I know that paper really well. Um, and I completely agree. There are a few cases where mm -hmm. um, this gets a little more complicated. Um, but I think that especially with LPS uh, makes things much more complicated because LPS can actually provide both signal one and signal two through separate signaling components. And so what I really like that uh, Dop has pointed out here is that um, we definitely oversimplified the inflammasome um, quite a bit last time. Um, and there are more and more kind of complex inflammasomes and more different types of alternative inflammasomes that have been described over the past few years. Okay. Um, there's some great work by John Kagan's lab on some of that. Um, and so I think that um, we're realizing there might just be more than one inflammasome, and we definitely implied that there was only the one type okay. um, in okay. that twib. All right. Always subtlety. Nuanced. Nuanced. Jop, Jop, I don't think, is one of our typical lay listeners. No. No. All right. One more. Uh, Rich, the first one from Jeremy, please. Okay. Uh, scroll back up here. Jeremy writes, Dear Twiv. I listened to your clear and informative discussion with Michael Warabee on TWIV 876 about his recent preprint showing the Hunan market was the epicenter of early COVID-19 cases. What a great episode that was. He explained that the earliest discovery of a case cluster was on December 27th by uh, Zhang Jixan, a doctor at the Hubei Provincial Hospital of Integrated Chinese and Western Medicine. However, other sources have made rather different claims. At about 17 minutes into, TWIV, into the TWIV special with Ian Lipkin, your guest said that he had first heard about the outbreak on December 15th from Liu Jiahai, a uh, professor at Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou. Uh, this is in stark contrast to the WHO report, which shows just six cases with symptom onset before this date. Lipkin has repeated this date several times since then. It would be helpful if someone could ask him for evidence of such an email, uh, uh, evidence such as email records to support this claim. Skeptics of the WHO timeline tend to cite two other media reports from March 2020. 
One is in the South China Morning Post about the efforts to retrospectively trace the earliest cases. It states that the first identified case was from November 17th and that 27 infections by uh, December 15th had been identified. This is about this is about a retrospective study. It doesn't corroborate or refute uh, Lipkin's claim. The other is about Connor Reed, a Welsh man who was living in Wuhan. He reported feeling ill on November 25th, going to a hospital on December 6th, where he received pneumonia diagnosis and receiving a retrospective COVID-19 diagnosis in January 2020. Unfortunately, he has since died in unrelated circumstances, which makes it difficult to corroborate his story. Of course, this is great fodder for the conspiracy theorists. People outside China, such as Ian Lipkin and friends, family of Connor Reeve, uh, Connor Reed may have important records that shed light on the murky early tideline of the pandemic. A serious investigation could collect evidence and, and either help or put to rest controversy, conspiracy theories or disprove the early timeline given in the WHO report. Best regards, Jeremy, and he gives uh, links uh, that are relevant to everything he's said here. I can't really comment uh, on this. I'd have to look uh, at it in detail. It's nice to have all these questions here. I'd want to bounce this off Warabi and get his reaction. Yeah, so I passed this on to Michael. I haven't heard from him, but um, maybe he'll let us know. He seemed to think that these were the earliest, the ones in his research were the earliest cases, right? So, I mean, everything else is hearsay, right? Yeah. <sighs> I mean, the cluster on this 27th is a documented hospital cluster, so that's reliable. So you got to talk to Ian, too. Yeah, he's apparently it's on the TWIV I did with him, but um, he said, yeah, he heard of it in, on the 15th from a professor. But this is kind of he said, she said stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's reliable. Yeah. I always be careful. I, I will ask him, but he can be cagey. Yeah, it, it seems like right now from the data that we have, um, this is the earliest case. It's hard to kind of fully, uh, you know, cite data from um, the Daily Mail or something like that. Um, and so right now, the data that Warobi has is probably the the most solid data. And as yet, these other things don't have sort of as solid data behind them. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist or that it couldn't be gathered. Um, but it's hard to make conclusions from data that is less solid. Do you remember what he said was the earliest that this could have emerged in the market? Do you remember the date? I don't remember the date. I don't remember the dates, but it was early. It was late November, early December. I, I was yeah. thinking November. Yeah, I, I think late November is correct, which would be consistent with some other cases uh, happening, right? I mean... I don't think that's a problem. And I wouldn't be surprised if you missed some. But anyway, we'll see what he says. And I'll ask Ian. <clears throat> All right, it's time for some picks. Brianne, what do you have this week? Uh, so I was uh, remaining on my sort of thinking about cool biology and biodiversity bent. I always really like it when I see a story about uh, biology and think, wow, we'd not, why didn't I know about that? Um, and this is one, uh, because apparently we have uh, few, if any, models for, of uh, octopi as model organisms um, because they cannot grow uh, in uh, the lab. They die after they lay eggs. And so if you were going to have many generations and do sort of some genetic modification um, and all of the things that we do um, when we use many of our other model organisms, it doesn't really work. And that's problematic because octopi are pretty cool, uh, particularly in terms of their nervous systems um, and things like that. And so this is a story of a lab looking for a model organism, uh, particularly a model octopus. And uh, one of my favorite parts is at the beginning where one of the scientists talks about how he found this cool octopus that had these stripes. Um, and um, in fact, uh, it was able to lay eggs and live in the lab. And that was cool. But then it couldn't, but that was the one that, that the scientist had. Um, so they had this one octopus and that was kind of it. 
Um, and um, so it was, it was cool. It, you know, uh, was published in a paper in 1984. Um, it seemed like a, a great research uh, model organism and um, the uh, researcher could not find um, any more of this octopus. And then um, a student um, called, a high school student called and wanted someone to watch his octopus while he went on vacation. <laughs> and um, the the researcher looked at a picture of this uh, this high school student's octopus and saw that it had the same characteristic markings. Um, and so suddenly there was a second one of this species oh, that awesome. uh, they had that's found. Um, and they were able to kind of use this to start uh, studying this octopus. They've sequenced genomes. Um, they've started to come up with some abilities to do genetics. I, I just really like the high school student story. So now do we, um, uh, we cause, so now we can rear these things in the laboratory. So now we can rear these things um, and we can, and they said that, you know, now they can go a few generations and we can do CRISPR um, and they can actually grow them in the lab. And we have a model organism um, for the octopus. Um, and I, I didn't know before this that we didn't uh, have one. And I can just imagine all of the cool things that we can now learn because of it. That's great. Maybe we can learn about octopus viruses. He's a cool looking little dude. He's not very <laughs> right? big either. He's a little no. guy. And so it makes a great model organism. <laughs> There's a, a cool video of him at the end of this, uh, or of it, uh, at the or, or of her, I don't know, <laughs> at the end of this article, uh, crawling yeah. through the tank. And uh, uh, it has a nice little volumetric flask to play with in his tank, mm -hmm. you know? Very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I, I got a big kick out of yeah, reading this about great. this. Octopi are great. I love them. Yeah. They have the have biggest. Have you seen that? What's that movie? My Octopus Teacher. I think we picked that at one point. Have you really? seen that? No, I haven't seen oh, it. Oh, man. This is a documentary about a guy who, you know, developed mm. a, this is in South Africa, I think, and he went diving every day. Man, in 50 degree water. Jeez. Oh. Um, and uh, he developed a relationship with this octopus. And he documented the whole thing. It's a My Octopus Teacher. It's a wonderful documentary. Mm. I recommend it. I think we picked it some time ago. Maybe um, Kathy or somebody picked it. The biggest brains of any invertebrate. That's so cool. It, I know. It's just great. And he says when he got this female, she laid eggs and he was bummed because he thought she would die. And then she didn't. <laughs> what a bummer. That's great. I love it. Very good. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, so th this is one of my nested multi picks. Okay. Uh, so I'll just tell the story. Uh, I've been a guest on a podcast by a guy. I don't know if I've ever, I don't think I've ever referenced any of his podcasts. His name is uh, Chris White. Uh, and he, uh, is a professor, a history professor, uh, professor at Marshall university. And, uh, I, over a year or so ago, he, he's a twiv listener and he had me on the show. Uh, to talk about SARS-CoV-2. He's done several different theme podcasts. His most recent is called Connected by uh, Controversy, and he looks at a number of different topics, uh, most of them uh, not scientific. But he uh, wanted to have Paul Offit on to talk about uh, vaccines and vaccine hesitancy, uh, and he had me on to uh, co-host it. So we did that podcast. So I got a link to his podcast, uh, as an aside, Chris has had me actually zoom into his classroom a couple of times, uh, which nice. sort of pushes my old teacher buttons, and it's been really <laughs> a blast. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, so at any rate, uh, um, he had Paul on. He had me co-host it, and we, uh, as a uh, theme for that discussion, we discussed uh, – Paul Offit's book, uh, Vaccinated, I think it is, which is the essentially a biography of Maurice uh, Hilleman uh, with a lot of vaccinology uh, in the background. And I, uh, subsequent to that podcast, I uh, used that as a pick, but that got me off on reading Paul Offit books, uh, which I have, uh, I had not read any of them before that. And um, I think it was uh, off mic on that podcast that I asked Paul, or maybe it was in an email afterwards, I asked him which was his favorite book because he's written about at least a half a dozen, maybe nine 
different books. And he said his favorite book was The Cutter Incident, which we've mentioned before and I think may have even been a pick before, but it's worth picking again. So I uh, uh, went off and read The Cutter Incident, and what a great book. Uh, it really it is, is an a, amazing it book. It is. I think that might be the first Paul Offit book I ever read. Uh, it's also the first that he wrote. He said it was the most challenging to write. Uh, and it is, uh, and it is also his favorite. So that's a story about this, uh, about the early days of the polio vaccine and this uh, one laboratory, the Cutter Laboratory, that made a batch of polio vaccine that wasn't completely inactivated, and uh, it was administered to quite a few uh, individuals, and quite a few got sick and a few died. So it was a mess. But the cool thing about it is that it's also uh, in the background a wonderful uh, story about the. Mm, sort of uh, scaling up uh, early vaccine manufacture and regulation. Because one of the problems was they didn't have their sort of regulatory um, act together, okay? And uh, so this shows how what the, what the problems were, how they were revealed, and how they got fixed. But one of the things I want to talk about the most is that um, a big part of this book is about the litigation yeah. that followed yep. all of this mm -hmm. uh, and suing a cutter for damage done to people and the evolution of the litigation process that resulted from this, where because of landmark cases that were decided, it turns out that you can sue a company for damages done by their product, even if everything they did was right, okay? Which really is an invitation to personal injury lawyers to sue for everything, okay? Yep. Yep. Uh, and the result of that was this, uh, what, the National Vaccine Compensation Act or whatever it is that mm -hmm. basically uh, taxes uh, vac or surcharges on vaccines to generate a pool of funds that uh, allows, that makes it so that if you have a, vaccine injury uh, case you have to appeal to through that particular process where you get rigorous science evaluating uh, your claim. But there are workarounds, okay? Uh, so that uh, there's the very narrow window of those vaccine-related injury cases that have to be processed through that, uh, through that mechanism. So, for example, thimerosal, which is uh, an additive, a preservative, um, does is not covered by that uh, federal program. And so personal injury lawyers can cook up a thimerosal problem. And there are several other examples of this. And uh, people are suing for tens of millions of dollars and winning on cases that are proven absolutely to have no scientific merit whatsoever. Uh, and so shame on the personal injury lawyers, big time. I wrote Paul after this and I said, you know, this is not good. And he said, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, I, the problem is it should not be a trial by jury. It should exactly. be a trial by a committee of scientists. Exactly. And that's what the federal program does. But the, the, the restrictions of the federal program to uh, say which cases have to go through that mechanism are uh, too mm. narrow. So there's there's... Uh, so that has to be that has to be changed. Yeah, I, understanding the <clears throat> background of that whole mechanism and that process was something that I really was glad that I had learned from that book. You know that this isn't the re that wasn't the reason why I read the book in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it was it was a really good thing because I feel like I hear arguments about vaccines of see they know that vaccines are bad. They even have a special court for it. Yeah. Um, and actually knowing something about the creation of that court, which I learned from that book, yeah. um, has been very useful in having discussions about those Or claims. that the feds are in cahoots with Big Pharma by ensuring right. the vaccine, so you have to pro process litigation through that court. Well, the problem is that without that and with this, you know, crazy uh, willy-nilly litigation, nobody wants to make vaccines anymore. Right. And, and so yeah. it's really nice to have backup on yeah. knowing how to argue against and this that claim. seems to be from the two books I've read characteristic of Offit books they look like they're about something and they are about that but they're about a lot more too so I, I learned having been on a uh, an expert on a polio litigation case that 
the lawyers find these individuals who have vaccine-associated polio, and they say, okay, you can go to this vaccine compensation fund and you can get a one to $200,000, or we can sue and I can get you millions of dollars. And a lot of people turn down the compensation to do that. So uh, I was on a case where the individual turned down the compensation. And this was a case where the father contracted polio after his baby daughter got vaccinated. So within the first year of life, uh, the baby gets vaccinated. And the, sometimes the child gets pol polio, but often the contact. So he got paralyzed and he, ha he couldn't work any longer. He was in a wheelchair. And this happened in the 80s. 20 years later, it finally went to trial. 20 years it took to get to trial. And um, the, the trial was a farce. The jury is falling asleep because they're not interested in the science. And the, def the, the, the plaintiffs bring out the daughter who's now married. And her big thing was she couldn't dance with her daddy at her wedding because he was paralyzed. And that swung it as far as I could tell. The jury said, oh, we have to give you. And they, they awarded him $20 million. I don't know if that oh. stood because, you know, you can appeal and uh, it gets reduced and so forth. But I said, why, do you, why don't you object to that witness? He said, yeah, it makes us look really nasty if we can't let the daughter, even though she has nothing to say that's of, of relevance, right? Um, and the stuff that they bring up is crazy. So I have boxes in my office of monkey neurovirulence tests for the lots of vaccine that were given to the to the daughter, right? And they will say, okay, in this assay, one of the monkeys had a three neurovirulence score out of 20. And we've never seen that before. So that must have caused the paralysis. I mean, stuff like that, it drives you crazy, you right? <laughs> so um, yeah, you can make a lot of money. That's what it's all about. And this, you're right, in this... In, in the Cutter incident, that set the precedent yeah. that you can sue, no matter, even if you did everything right. And and Letterly Labs, who made the vaccine, they did everything right. It was, there was nothing wrong with what they did, and still they're liable. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Uh, okay, I have a vaccine pick, which actually is a repick. I picked this a number of years ago, but I think it's worth looking at. It's a 2017 editorial in, in PNAS, Open Access. Simply put, Vaccination Saves Lives by Walter Orenstein and, and Rafi Ahmed. And they basically go through the numbers of why vaccines are good, right? Few measures in public health can compare with the impacts of vaccines. And they go through the numbers. They talk about transmission, community protection, and so forth. Uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the vaccine committee and how decisions are made and so forth. Looks like say, a real easy read. It's an easy read. I think it's worth it for people to yeah. read. You know, in the end, they say vaccines don't work if you don't use them. So please do. Uh, we have a couple of listener picks. Uh, one is from Rich, who writes, you might be interested in this as a listener pick, as Darwin's sketch of the Tree of Life has been mentioned several times, including as a tattoo. The, book, the notebooks had been missing from Cambridge University Library for 15 to 20 years, stolen. And the the article is a um, uh, BBC News article. Stolen Charles Darwin notebooks left on library floor in a pink gift bag. They were returned to the library 22 years after they were last seen. The small leather-bound books worth millions of pounds include the Tree of Life sketch. Wow. You know, where he wrote, I think, and then he did a sketch of a tree of life. Wow. In his, Wow, I didn't realize that. But anyway, the, the reference to the tattoo. At ASV in London, Ontario, 2015, I know because I was president that year, we were all in a bar afterwards, and this this girl had a had the tattoo on her arm. I took a I asked her, can I take a picture of it? She's a virologist. She said, Of course. <laughs> I took a and I showed it in my evolution class because it's very cool. It's right on her shoulder there. Yeah. Uh, that's really that's great. So these were actually heard. stolen, and somebody anonymously returned them. Is apparently, the yeah. Wow. Apparently, heavy duty. And we also have a, a pick from Neva. Actually, we have three picks. Neva 
uh, a, a tweet from Alan Thomas, UK textile artist who uses embroidery, crochet, and felt work to create unique works resembling Petri dishes and bacterial spores. This is very cool. These are beautiful uh, using Ooh. embroidery and stuff. So thank wow. you for that. And finally from Vicky, being a devoted listener to Microbe TV and a devoted listener to History of English podcasts, I'm guessing other Microbe TV groupies might enjoy both as I do. Uh, and so she says, jump right in with episode 95 about the invention of the university and the PhD during the 12th and 13th centuries. That cool. seems like a cool one. Yeah. That does seem really cool. History of English podcast. Wow. Hmm. I need to probably listen to this because yeah. I'm always complaining about the language. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> All right. That'll do it for TWIV885. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have a question, a comment, a pick, send it to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy what we do, we would love to have your financial support. We don't run ads. We don't monetize. We depend on your support to help us to communicate science. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And we are a 5013C nonprofit, so your contributions here in the U.S. are federal tax deductible. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Uh, matter of fact, I am rejuvenated. This has been a wonderful episode. All right. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>